Uh, welcome everybody and uh, glad you could join us for this Reflections on Retirement uh, session as part of our Managing Me um, uh, series, which we started a while back as an in-person event and kind of had to figure out how to make it work virtually. So um, you all are part of an experiment and we will just see how well all of this works. Um, again, Mark Salter, Executive Director for the CFA Society of Minnesota. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Megan, to advance to the next slide, please, so that we can do a couple of quick thank yous. And there it is, okay. Uh, we have to thank our annual sponsors. We, um, we, we are blessed with a number of firms who want to make sure that we can continue to do uh, good, intriguing, um, helpful, sessions, professional learning sessions like this, whether or not it's in person or virtual. So thank you to RBC, DGI, Newbie, all of the folks that you see on the screen here and um, we can't do it without you. And one more slide very quickly. We also need to thank CFA Institute when the pandemic hit um, and started accelerating back in the spring. They said, gee, I wonder if the societies might like to have a Zoom meetings license to help them uh, continue to do what they like to do. And we said, yes, please. So um, we have this license from them to make things like this possible. So um, the last thing I will say is just the housekeeping part of this. It's kind of like Fight Club. There are no rules. Uh, actually, we haven't quite figured out how we want to do Q&A. So, uh, Carol, when I turn it over to you, I will let you explain how we're going to do that. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I'm assuming we're going to use the chat function uh, as we can. So, um, uh, but this is one of the things we need to work out in the new virtual world. So with that, Carol, Ron, and Diana, please take it away and thank you so much for doing this for us. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for letting me moderate. I just want to make it um, a couple of housekeeping items. Typically on Zoom, if you're not familiar with it, it is easiest. We do welcome questions as we're going, but put them in the chat screen. So if you don't have it up on your screen on the bottom of your, if you're not familiar with Zoom on the bottom, there should you should be able to see different icons that say mute, stop video, participants chat. So click on the chat and it'll open up the box and you can go ahead and type either privately or type um, to the whole group in there and I'll try to monitor those as we go. Point number two, even though this is about retirement and I'll be moderating to folks who are recently in retirement, um, I, on the other hand, am fascinated with the topic, but in no way contemplating retirement, which was why it was interesting in looking at the attendee list. Several of the people that I worked with decades ago, but it feels like last week uh, at U.S. Bank are on this call, and tons of you I do know and have had experience running into. So this for me is just a fascinating process of thinking about retirement as one option, but there's also the other option of career pivot and doing something not as intensely in the investment business. So we'll explore some of that too. And for those of you out there who are thinking through those lines, feel free to bring the questions in on that, on that regard. So as I mentioned, both Diana and Ron have recently retired. So we'll start with having them briefly talk about um, perhaps where you worked, um, how long you worked, and then what series of thoughts prompted the first inkling of thinking about retirement? Was it a particular triggering event or were there a series of events? How did that process look for you to make the decision to pull the plug, basically? So Diana, why don't we start with you? Okay, can you hear me? Yep, sounds okay. great. Well, hello everybody, even though I can't see you. Um, so I, I would, been in, had been in the investment industry for um, 43 years. Um, the first part of that, uh, I was basically on the buy side as an in-house investment uh, manager. And then the last uh, 20 years, I was in investment consulting and uh, specifically, um, 
uh, for the last um, 18 years uh, as a principal of, of a, one of three principals of a, of a firm in St. Paul. Uh, Berthel Shutter was that firm. Uh, and <clears throat> so I retired uh, in 2017. Uh, I was 66 at the time. And, uh, but my first serious thoughts about retiring were uh, five years earlier, and that um, coincided with a business transaction. Uh, so basically, um, at that time, the end of 2012, uh, the principals of our firm had decided to combine with another firm in Minneapolis, an investment consulting firm. And so basically as a result of that transaction, uh, for the first time, uh, I had some clarity uh, from a financial perspective uh, that helped me pinpoint uh, a date that would be appropriate for me to retire, prudent, uh, and then also from a client service standpoint, uh, appropriate to um, make the transition that I needed to make. So uh, that was, um, you know, no, no serious thinking about retirement before that point because I was too busy um, working and, and uh, so. But it sounds like a pretty methodical process starting in, with that first transaction back in 2012 and then that. And so we'll, we'll delve into some of that thought process and how you prep for actual retirement and subsequent questions. So okay. thank you. Ron, how about you? Sure, how's, how's the sound for me? Is that pretty good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I consider I started my investment career. I taught economics, corporate finance, University of Wisconsin, La Crosse in the early 80s. Then I moved up here and was fortunate to get a job at what was First Trust at the time, U.S. Bank. And then I moved on later to uh, First Asset Management and then to MSI, where I ultimately was their chief investment officer. Then I had the good fortune of one day to answer the phone and Bill Frells was on the other line. And I, in the year 2001, I joined Mars and Power. And I'm recently retired in uh, 2019 in the summer. I guess um, the thought of retiring didn't really enter my mind. During that period at Myers and Power, I had a series of four cancer operations and radiation, hormone therapy. So kind of as you go through that, you kind of wonder, you know, if your book, is this really your last chapter? So I guess that got me to thinking, you know, that I probably wanted to see what the next chapter of my life was. So I, you know, I, I worked with my partners more than my family to kind of determine when a date would work for them and uh, set a date uh, in the summer of uh, June of 2019, I've been retired a little over a year. So um, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Mark, I forgot to ask if we could do a poll in here because one of the things I'm curious about is how many people in our listenership are either currently retired or thinking about retired. And maybe if we can't do a poll, we could, we could chat in. Um, I'm just curious if most of you are contemplating it or... What drew you to today's session? Um, let us figure that out, how to do the poll. Um, okay. So if it all of a sudden appears, you'll know we figured. Uh, um, actually, people are putting in the chat right now. This yep. is, let's just stick with that. Okay. So we've got some retired, some contemplating. That's what I would expect. Oh, um, really like the, there's another comment in here, not even close, but thinking about how do I go through helping my clients go through that decision. And I think that's a very impactful thing. I've seen a lot of my clients really struggle with that. 
um, giving long term couple years out building succession teams. Um, very cool, still 15 plus years out. I sort of feel like I'm in that 15 to 20 year range as well, like I have another thing. But anyway, just so it, it's nice, it seems like we have a nice mix of folks in here. So um, let's go on to our next question. And you can, you guys can either respond to these in any, in either order, because it's a lot of times when you're on a panel, it's hard to always be the, the final one. Um, so maybe we'll shift it up. What discussions with family and friends have, did you have or should you have had as you thought through the next phase? Because Ron, in particular, you mentioned that you, you spent a lot of time talking with your partners than necessarily the home, but what changes did you contemplate or make to plans as a result of some of those conversations? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, so I knew my wife always wanted me to retire sooner versus later. Um, but I really hadn't given it much thought. And I think if I can give anybody advice, probably it is a good idea to discuss it more with your spouse, your significant other, and your family. So it was really kind of my decision, and I was lucky enough to be an owner. So the timing was my call, not the company's call. But the period uh, of transition was kind of I wanted to be mindful for my clients because we all care about our clients. But as I've had time to reflect, you know what, we're all replaceable. So, um, and you know, people that uh, generally are hired uh, to replace you have, you know, skills and talents and enthusiasm. So I probably came up short on discussions with the family. I think that would have been more helpful in retrospect. So what kinds of discussions would you have had with them that you didn't have? Well, how would, how, what would they want me to do? You know, kind of in a typical day, I, one of my clients told me early on that a husband retiring into his wife's space is a little bit like a grand piano in the kitchen. Nice to have, but gets in the way. So just kind of how would, <laughs> what, what would be our plans separately and jointly in a retirement phase. I think that would have been helpful. We're, we've worked through those issues now and the COVID has kind of derailed everything, but um, I think that would have been those type of discussions. And I'm blessed to have grandkids and uh, daughters that live very close. So kind of at least having some discussions with them. That's awesome. How about you, Diana? Uh, Similar, uh, most of my discussions were with business partners. Um, I uh, became a single parent. My daughters were in, uh, in high school. And so uh, basically it would have just been my daughters that I would talk to. And, and I did speak with them. Uh, one had uh, recently graduated from college and the other um, another year or so. Uh, and uh, I wanted to let them know that I, that uh, they would not be affected in their uh, uh, college uh, tuition and so forth. Um, I was mo most interested in, uh, in, hearing whether any might be coming back home to live with me uh, <laughs> uh, because one of them of course graduated during the last financial crisis and did come home and so you kind of never know when that cycle will end uh, but uh, they were uh, excited and, and supportive. That's awesome. So for both of you, was it all or none, a gradual exit or a pivot to a new set of portfolio jobs like part-time teaching, board membership, consulting, nonprofit or political work? Was there any sort of thought along that lines? Um, and if so, what kinds of questions did you ask yourself or how did you contemplate and think about that? Diana, do you want to start? Sure. Um, when I, uh, as I said, when I sort of pinpointed uh, 2017 or 2018 to retire, um, 
I thought a lot about how I'd spent so much of my life in that industry. And I really felt it was important to just take this opportunity to kind of just step away almost completely, not entirely. And so I, I did purposefully want to leave my calendar for the next couple of years or at least open. Uh, I really enjoy traveling and, and so I, um, once I, when that point arrived in December of 2017, I did step down from work and I had been on two committees at that point. And I also, uh, in, out of respect for their uh, operations, stepped down from those. Um, and, and, I, and I feel good about that. Uh, three months later, I did join um, uh, as a volunteer, a, a committee for a nonprofit that happened to be a, one of the clients that I used to service. Um, and, and I think that level is just enough uh, for me at this time. Um, and so I have not been proactive about um, staying uh, uh, significantly connected to the field. Okay. How, Ron, how about you? What's it look like for you? Again, I think you can take me as an example. I'm not offering up this is the best way to do it. So I kind of just hustled real hard at work to the end and didn't give much thought other than I kind of like an empty calendar when I retired. So I basically kind of went from going full speed to zero. So since then, I've discovered that zero is not really good, good speed for me. So I've done some philosophic work um, on two investment committees. I'm currently teaching an investment class. I've taken an online investment class um, trying to mentor about three people. Um, so I, I just felt that I wanted a little bit of time to kind of not get my calendar too full. Uh, but then um, kind of having the energy and the interest I, and the desire, because I had a fun career, to try to fill out how to figure out how to fill in some pieces. So I think I've done a pretty good a job of that. But again, if I had to do it over, I probably would have thought a little more clearly that going from a, um, something that is your passion to not being able to do it at all is going to be a tough, tough transition. I was going to say, it sounds like a pretty full calendar, though, with, with a lot of different portfolio things put together there. It does, and that's, it's fun. It's varied. Um, it's not as con time consuming, but again, it's, it's all areas where you can put as much work kind of into it as you want. And so that, that's nice. So it, it's, it's kind of, it's filled the void. Yeah, that's awesome. So it, related to that, how did the social fabric of your days or existence change? Did you cut yourself off from investment thinkers speak? And I know you've already touched on this. Is there anything else either one of you wants to expand on for ex it, instance, Diana, I'm interested after 44 years in the business, was it easy or hard to disconnect yourself, especially with this volatile? Because if you did this in 2017, we're talking right post 2016 election and markets have been a little interesting in the last few years. Has it been hard to stay out or has it been cathartic to stay out? Well, um, I... It, it's, it was, it, the hardest thing is really um, not being able to interact with those who I had interacted with for 10 to 15 years before I, I left. Uh, that I think was the hardest thing, but um, I, I do um, stay informed and I enjoy that. Um, I started watching Squawk Box on CNBC in the mid 80s and I still watch it. You know, I kind of feel like I know what's going on every day um, in, in the markets and in the economy with that. And I have remained a, a, a re retired or inactive member of the CFA and, and that um, 
I've gone to some of the socials and, and uh, once COVID is over, I hope to be involved a little bit more as a volunteer there. But um, it was, um, I, th I think just the, the social interaction was the hardest piece for me to uh, adjust to. <clears throat> Yeah, I think related to this, I'll have you expand on it and I'll have Ron, you take this as well in terms of the social fabric, but were you thoughtful or intentional about trying to build a post-retirement support network or is that something that would have been, to, it would have been nice to be more intentional about? It would have been nice to be more intentional about. I just, uh, I don't have regrets about not doing it because things have popped up where all of a sudden, oh, you know, I'd never been to Alaska before and all of a sudden I have an invitation to go to Alaska. And if I had been on, uh, if I had commitments uh, or to other organizations or, or whatever, volunteer, you know, I might've had to miss out on that. So um, I, I probably could have been more intentional, but that's something that, um, I, I can always do. In the yep. Future. Yeah. How about you, Ron? Well, as far as the social fabric, I think that is something that I miss dearly. So, um, at the end of my career, I was fortunate enough to work with people who were in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies. So you had a kind of a wide range and also it was a nice tight, cohesive unit. So you felt that it was really um, a strong social network. And then I have to tell you, in all honesty, when you retire, uh, you find, in fact, that it is a work environment. A work environment, I mean that they basically communicated and you had interaction because of proximity, because of your job, because of your responsibility. So really, a lot of people just drift away and that's perfectly understandable. So I really miss um, the, the social aspect. And the other thing is, then you find yourself spending more time with your age group. And I'm kind of a, a adolescent in a body of a 60 plus year old person. So my wife has a lot of wonderful friends, but when I talk about, well, let's go mountain biking in Montana or let's bike across Iowa, or let's go camping, um, I get a lot of stares. So <laughs> to get past the COVID, I have to work harder on finding those social outlets. And what I will enjoy is um, just not being limited to the same age that I am because it keeps your mind young. So that, you know, to me, that was a big loss and, and kind of a disappointment. The phone stops ringing, so to, pe so to speak, and you gotta do outgoing calls. Yeah, I'll bet that's where mentoring though can help yeah. supplement some of that because it does keep you plugged into, it typically keeps you plugged into a different um, yeah. demographic. Yeah. yeah, all, all wise stuff. Do we have any, I'll take a pause here because I've been asking all the questions and I have a ton more questions to ask, but I'm curious if anybody from the audience wants to chat in any particular questions. I keep going on. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So Ron, you mentioned, uh, I think you said you're on one or two boards. Diana, uh, I'm interested for you as well. So A, uh, maybe just a little bit, how do you get on a board? How do you network to do that? Um, I, I assume it's relatively easy in terms of you decide ahead of time, here's some boards I'd be interested in getting on. So then how do you execute on that? Sure, well, I'll go first. In my, in my case, one of them is a church board. So I was involved for a long period of time. And as people get to know you and kind of appreciate the work you do, and there's opportunities. So ultimately, it was an opportunity to head the investment committee and I took that. As far as the other board, it's a family board. I'm happy to say I'm the first non-family member on the investment committee. So that was uh, someone I worked with and they, uh, 
uh, they just like I, I said the story about Bill Frells. I think if you play nice in the sandbox, if you're a good coworker, people will remember you. Uh, if you're kind of sandpaper, people will remember that too. So mine were more just kind of being there, uh, being available, and uh, taking the opportunity. The other one that I'm interviewing for, it's COVID has kind of put that on hold right now. And that also was kind of someone that knew me uh, through kind of a client. Yeah, I think we'll let Diana comment too. But one thing to think through too, Andrew, is that, and I encourage a lot of the younger people that I mentor to think through this too, is that you don't necessarily have to go from not being on a board to being on a board. A lot of times, especially given our financial background and our investment background, they love having ad hoc members on just the investment committee or the finance committee. And so I try to get people placement in those committees too, because that can be a way to illustrate to the board over a long period of time, the kinds of work you do. And quite frequently boards, especially if they're of non-financial companies, struggle to get the expertise they need on those committees. And a lot of times you don't have to be a board member to be on those committees. So Diana, comments? Yes, and that was the capacity that I served on uh, as, as volunteer on committees. It was a, a, an advisor, a committee that is an advisory committee to the board and generally um, uh, made up of uh, the, sometimes the organization members and then outside professionals and then um, other times uh, just outside professionals. And so um, the first, uh, committee that I was uh, in, I was basically invited to be on by someone in the industry who knew me and knew that this committee was looking for someone. Uh, and then uh, uh, another one, I had done a investment policy project for, um, this, this would be an arts uh, nonprofit. And about a year later, uh, they came and asked if I would be interested in serving as a volunteer on their committee. Um, and then the last one, as I mentioned, um, was a client um, that I worked with for about 15 years. Uh, but before that, I was for two years a volunteer committee uh, member. And I basically told them after two years that I, I couldn't devote as much time as I, as I had been. And so then they asked if I would be a consult their consultant, which I was. And then when I left, they asked if I would uh, continue on. So as, as a committee member. And so it's, um, I think uh, letting people know uh, in, in the industry that that's something you're interested in. And uh, the other thing I would say, um, Andrew, there will be plenty of opportunities, but don't be afraid to say no, because I've been approached by some nonprofits. And when you kind of look, they have good causes, but it's really a cat's breakfast, which means you're going to, so there's, a, it would be a lot more work and that you would be basically helping them uh, in all aspects of running their business. So if it doesn't feel right, um, there'll be somebody else that can pick up that mantle. So I think you gotta make sure that you pick the best spot for yourself. Yeah, and a couple other comments. Um, you can always check with your alumni associations to check in with college professors and, and alumni, because a lot of times they'll get approached there. And then, for those of you who don't have chat open, you might want to open it because Dave Stevens shared a link to, there's a website evidently that, that lists opportunities of, um, of board members. But the other thing to keep in mind too with the nonprofit board is it's pretty standard. The one thing you want to check as you're considering your nonprofit boards is what kind of a financial obligation you need to make because part and parcel of going on a nonprofit board is is whether or not you're on the fundraising committee, you're on the fundraising committee because that's part of being on a nonprofit board is being responsible um, for helping 
that firm, that entity's reputation in the public marketplace and helping connect them potentially with donors or being willing to speak about the cause to potential donors and then to make a financial contribution yourself. And some of them, it's a, it's a looser contribution. Some of them, it's like, especially the big arts, arts um, organizations in town have very big dollar commitments in order to be on the board. Yeah, and I, I wanted, this is Mark again, I wanted to give a shout out to David uh, Propel, uh, the link he provided. Propel is a really good resource, and I just plugged in another one uh, for the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And awesome. I did a quick quick search and just narrowed the um, parameter to board positions and there were 15 um, right now. So, but Carol makes a really good point. Um, look at what they're looking for, because a lot of the arts organizations are indeed looking for um, uh, financial resources too. And if it's a cause you believe in, it's it's much easier to do. Um, so anyway, thanks. Yep. Thanks for the question. That was a good question. Um, so let's pivot just a little bit and talk about what do you miss relative to tools, resources, anything you can supplement. We've talked a little bit about the, the personal side of things, missing those networks that we had, but are there specific tools or resources and you know, access to a Bloomberg terminal? And if you don't have access or don't want to pay for that access, what do you do to supplement if you do want to stay plugged in? Ron, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Well, I'll go first on this one. So I had a Bloomberg on my desk since uh, 1985 to 2000 and 20. So it's a wonderful tool. It's not an inexpensive tool. Um, so I've kind of got Bloomberg light. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, it's just what I would call a lot of pick and shovel work. So the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, I've gone old school, I get value line, uh, Financial Times, The Economist, and then you're kind of stuck uh, with kind of the free stuff you can grub around the financials. Uh, and then maybe presentations on the website. Um, but what I miss most is the things that are not scripted. So, uh, you know, the presentations are going to be scripted. But as an individual investor, it's very hard to get and have tours. It's very hard to sit down and talk to management. So those are where I felt I got insights. And so that's really kind of what I miss most. And the uh, interaction with your colleagues, because... Some colleagues, frankly, are good uh, contrary indicators. Hmm. And it was always kind of nice to know that. And then there were uh, colleagues that were very insightful. So uh, those are the things I miss. Kind of like clients. Some clients are your good bell ringers on the top yeah. and the bottom, Both right? Sides. Both sides. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Diana, how about you? Are there tools or things that you miss? Uh, well, um, when I retired, I got a, a Mac laptop, MacBook, and I'd never used an Apple product before. I'd always on Windows. And within six months, I had to get a Surface, a Windows Surface, because I just, I couldn't make that transition. And so now I have two laptops. I have a really good scanner um, and, a, and a good printer. And I have... Um, that pretty much uh, covers what I need. Uh, thing I would like to have is an administrative assistant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all we all need one of those. Um, so, how about let Let's expand on that a little bit in terms of there's the investment tools. Were there certain things that either of you or both of you had saved up to do in retirement or felt like you were free now to do? What is that, what did that look like? And are you sorry that you waited to do it until retirement or has it been wonderful to do it in retirement? So maybe talk, discuss some of that. Well, um, like I say, I had done some traveling uh, in the first two years. And then uh, I was supposed to go to Germany in uh, April of this year, but COVID came along and I didn't. And 
and then I began looking at um, what else I could do. And so I've always wanted to speak another language and I have friends and relatives in Austria and Germany. And so I um, found a, a, a Zoom course, uh, German language and uh, started that and I'm signed up to start the uh, second uh, version tomorrow uh, for the fall. And I, I find it um, very um, uh, helpful for exercising parts of your brain that you, you don't get to uh, have the opportunity to do as much when you're not working every day. So remind me, um, in our prep call you were talking about, wasn't there some art or some running and some other things that you had opted to take up too? Yes. Um, I had envisioned that I would uh, be able to do uh, more running than I had time to do when I was working. But when the time came, I started finding that age, aging, uh, those effects really uh, put the kibosh on that. And I've been told that walking is actually better for you than running. And so I do walk, but I don't feel it's better for me <laughs> get the same thing out of it. Um, so that's a disappointment, um, but uh, certainly I enjoy my walks. Um, I also, at one time when I was younger, I used to do a lot of drawing and painting and uh, something that I missed while working and I thought oh well I'll do that when I retire and and I found also that just sort of my handwriting my uh, I don't know if it's coordination or what but it's just it just doesn't come as easily as it did when I was younger so I am uh, finding other ways to be creative but uh, it for me that was kind of a, a lesson that as you're working and you're um, you know, trying to accomplish uh, your work and education objectives that um, if you have the opportunity to build in some of those um, hobby-like um, activities, it's, it's good to try to do it. Um, so the lesson is don't wait, lead, try to lead an integrated life all the way through. That's, that's right. Which is tough. Ron, how about you? What? Well, what I tried to do for the first year, and um, COVID derailed a little bit of it, but I tried to come up with 12 adventures. So every month I would have an adventure. It wouldn't awesome. necessarily always be a big one, but um, it mostly revolved around travel, but it could be taking a class kind of outside my comfort zone or going to kind of a horse ranch with my wife, something I, I normally wouldn't do. So I, I thought it was important to kind of have something to look forward to each month. So I kind of laid that out. A, a lot of it did get derailed by COVID. <laughs> and you guys are talking about exercise. Uh, as you get older, exercise is a diminishing return. So no one wants to hear my life story, but my first day of retirement, we we're going to farmer's market and I'm chasing one of my grandkids and I step off the curb and tear my meniscus. So I'm still, oh. still recovering from that. In fact, today I'm getting an injection of some jelly so I can maybe hobble on. But uh, my, my message also would be don't wait on these things. If you have your health and you have the resources and you have the opportunity, um, because we really should bring it present value it back to today. So my boss way back when, George Mars used to say, two best things about the day, waking up, getting up. And that's now my attitude. That's awesome. I think COVID too, and the, the weirdness of the last six months have a lot of people all the way through the age spectrum really rethinking the, do I give 80 hours a week and, and full attention span to work or do I try to and I hate the word balance because it implies this ethereal state that you get to that's perfect. So I always talk a lot more about integration. How do you get all of the things 
fit into your day in pretty evenly spaced things and, and stay focused on family and grandkids and, and lots of different activities and doing things, especially with spouses. Um, so I'll stop and check in. We've got 20 minutes left. Any, uh, any other questions that pop to mind? I've still got a ton more to ask here, but I'm curious if anyone out there has any additional questions that have been spawned by the conversation so far. All right, so um, along the lines of social fabric and creating that, what should or can the local or national CFA society be doing to help bridge the gap in resources? Are there things that we could be doing to plug in more? You know, Ron, you talked about that support network and that social fabric, but having it be multi-generational. So we've got the monthly gatherings that, that have the, um, cocktail receptions that happen, I think, on a Thursday once a month. Are there other things that we should be doing to, to help? We've got the mentoring program through the CFA Society, too. Is there, would it make sense to have um, a support group of, of this type of people thinking about retirement, in retirement, or, or post-retirement? Well, Mark, I talked to Mark about actually something like this and we kind of got it off the ground. My experience is it feels like in CFA, and I think this would be pretty much across all societies, is that when people retire, they kind of drift away. So those people retiring have a great amount of talent. So it's trying to capture them and see if they can do some mentoring or see if they can join other retirees in maybe kind of a specialized meeting or book club or we're dealing with some of those issues rather than just kind of let them drift off. Because what I see in retirement, now that I'm in retirement, tremendously talented people, and I don't want to say they're going to waste, they're doing their thing. But as I look around the world, there's a lot of things that need to be worked on. So I was trying in my little mind to match talent versus need. So I just hate to see people just kind of drift off because they're immensely talented and they have a lot to offer. So would some sort of um, an information bank or something be useful to have there in terms of here's resources that where people could weigh in on, I could be a speaker, I could be a coach, I could meet one-on-one right. -on -one with someone. Right. right, That yes, things like that. Just kind of an inventory of things that I might now be interested in uh, and if the society would somehow come across those things or match me up or I'm interested in teaching math, you know, but I prefer to do it at a grade school level. So if right. a society ever does, uh, has those type opportunities. And I know we are kind of looking at a foundation and looking at doing some of these activities, but um, as our baby boomers are moving into retirement, they will be looking for things to do and add value and have purpose. Okay. That's useful. Diana, any thoughts come to mind? Well, I just uh, go back to the question that was asked about how to get on uh, a committee and the fact that there are some websites or lists of organizations that are looking for that and, and maybe perhaps um, local chapters of, of the CFA um, might uh, be a repository for um, uh, organizations that are looking for a committee member uh, to post that information. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, financial considerations. What benefits and financial considerations did you consider ahead of time before taking the leap into retirement? Were there things you missed, specific steps you took to prepare? What were some of the actual strategic things that you did in order to get ready to retire? Ron, why don't we start with you? Sure, again, kind of use me as an example of not what not to do. <laughs> so I, I didn't really have, I've been blessed. I didn't have to sit down and do a budget and all that kind of things. But what I didn't uh, really give any thought to was the whole Social Security, and I'm not an expert, and I'm not going to tell you when to sign up to Social Security and how to do it. 
but there's social security type issues, then there's Medicare and Medicaid and supplement insurance. So um, there's times and windows. So I really uh, was blissfully unaware of that stuff. So I had to do some hustling to get that. So I mean, that's usually kind of a, when you're working, that's an HR function and, and that's nice. But when you're retired or near retirement, guess what? It's your responsibility. So I would say, you know, uh, do a little more work on, on that whole social security, insurance, supplement, and get it right, get the timing right, um, because otherwise, the government has consequences if you don't do it right. So did you end up doing it yourself or did you pull in an accountant or an, advise, an external advisor to help? I did trial and error myself, yes. Okay. I don't know. I think it's probably worth uh, talking to someone that's uh, an expert in that area. Yeah. Uh, just to save the hassle. I mean, to kind of deal with that, your first, like, you know, you've got this unbelievable freedom, and then you have to deal with the bureaucracy of government. It's just like <laughs> kind of a mind bender. I bet. How about you, Diana? What what did you prep for and did you run into any potholes? Well, I almost, I was saved from making a mistake on Social Security by one of those government workers. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, I too uh, had my, the financial part, um, I was pretty well set with, but, um, and I thought I read uh, thoroughly what my benefit options were under Social Security. Uh, and so I made an appointment to go in and sign up. And it, when I did, you went to an office and do that. You could do it online, but I, I always feel a little bit better about doing those things in person if I can. And so you do have to wait in line and you know wait for 45 minutes and finally you get to meet with this person. And uh, as we were progressing and she's going over my information, um, she just basically informed me that um, I had another option I wasn't aware of. And that is because I was a widow, I had the option of first retiring on my husband's, social, my deceased husband's social security benefit and allowing my own benefit to be deferred until I was 70, in which case it would be a, a larger amount. And so that, um, that, uh, was something that I totally would have missed, and and it it um, was a a nice uh, benefit. And she was very uh, diligent, and I uh, had to get change all the paperwork that I had prepared, and and so um, I think that's awesome. It's yeah. awesome and encouraging to hear that you got good advice from the Social Security Administration. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> So, and I guess one of the other things to think about are those of you who work at shops that have planners on staff and things like that, it probably makes some sense to, to take them to coffee and think through some of those issues. And I, I know at Abbott Downing, we deal with a lot of pre-planning and planning for, for folks that are thinking about retirement. And there's a lot of that stuff that comes up. Unfortunately, I usually tune it out when they're having that discussion with the clients because it's as dry as a master's in taxation is to me, and I would much rather deep dive the markets. But so the the admonition being as you're contemplating retirement, maybe think through some of the planners that you know and or accountants that you know and, and hit them up for some help and guidance on what the specifics of. I would Definitely. <laughs> if your particular situation might be. So thank heavens you ran into someone who is very knowledgeable about that, though, because that, I would imagine, is a pretty big shift. Yes, and, and that she took, you know, she was, um, she kept probing, like, you know, did I remarry or I'm just, no, no, no. It's, I'm, and uh, so she was um, very thorough and uh, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, 
Did, I know we've already asked some of this. Well, talk to, talk to us, let's spend these last few minutes talking about um, what's been the biggest delight about retirement? What's been the biggest challenge? Sort of the biggest thing that's better than you expected and the other thing that might be thing or things that, that might be, oh, I didn't anticipate that at all and I don't like it very much. Ron? Okay, well, I think my biggest challenge is I really was never in my career a very good manager of people. I think I was a reasonable manager of money uh, investments, but I didn't have much of a bid for managing people. So when you're retired, you have one person to manage. And my problem is I know myself. So I knew that was going to be a challenge. So what I mean around that is just kind of managing your time, um, not doing too much or too little, having some measurement of how you're doing, um, uh, and or if you're making progress. So I think that was kind of my biggest challenge is really just managing me because I knew that was, that was quite a character and I had to deal with that. So what tips and tricks have you, have you learned from that process? I think, you know, some of the basic stuff they tell you is kind of loosely put an agenda out. You know, this is kind of, and this isn't like goals, but this is like where I like to spend this week. This is the, the energy flow I would like to do. Uh, this, you know, because I found that I was measured in my career for, you know, 40 plus years. So I, when I retired, I kind of suspended measurement for a while, which I don't know if is a good thing to do or not. I mean, I think we're over measured in our business, in our industry. So, but now it's like, now I'm kind of getting back to some reasonableness. So, you're, you know, you, the, you need to do these projects before it becomes winter. You need to uh, sign up for this stuff on time or whatever. So I think that that's kind of, um, that's been a challenge. So, I mean, because there's no one looking over your shoulder. Maybe right. your significant other or your spouse is, um, but they know you well enough to kind of cut you a lot of slack on that front. <laughs> okay. but I, how, about, how about you, Diana? And I think what I can say this year, the third year, is that the thing that I like the most about it is, um, as, as was just discussed, um, having can, not having to adhere to somebody else's schedule. And so that does leave you open to having no schedule. But on the other hand, it's really a nice feeling to um, be able to um, do what you want to do when you want to do it and, and know that you can do that. Um, I didn't feel that way in the first couple of years, but uh, I do now. And I, I really value that. <laughs> So were there um, potholes, anything unexpected that, that you really dislike about retirement, either of you? Well, I don't like uh, memory loss. And, and you know, you, you start not being able to think of the name of a person or the writer of a certain book and, and that kind of grows. And I remember when I would meet with clients and, um, and all of a sudden we'd be making, uh, talking about when we were going to meet again and looking and, and, well, what day is it today? And I would laugh because they never knew what day it was. Well, um, within about six months after I retired, you start to have to think about what day is it again? And so that's um, a little unnerving. And uh, one reason why I'm kind of motivated to try to um, take a language class or something that kind of exercises your brain in a, in a different way. Right. Well, I, might so, have class. I, don't, I don't even remember what I don't remember anymore these days. So, but I would say my biggest uh, pothole kind of is just really 
you have a lot of time on your hands. So you need to kind of fill it with what you think is important to you. Um, whereas it'll work, it, it really takes up a lot of your time and your energy. So that is all going to be yours to do with what you want. Right. So maybe one last question. Any classes, books, podcasts that have been helpful on the retirement process? Either prepping for it or being in it? Okay, well, I've got a, a couple. So I took a class. Um, Adina actually had a class and it was put on by Think to Perform. But away from that, they had a purpose class, uh, Richard Leiter. So it's repackaging your bags. So the whole point of that class was what is your purpose? So it's a lot of people that were in career transition or in retirement. So when you wake up and you put your feet on the ground, what's your purpose for that day? So I would kind of recommend that. Um, 60 things to do before you're 60. I'm, I'm past 60, but that was by our sellers. But I, I would not be afraid of uh, contacting some of these kind of life coaches that are out there. So there's a lot of resources for sure. You just have to find some that match up with kind of your take on how you want to do it. All right. How about you, Diana? Um, I, I've been negligent in that regard, but um, one person that I talked to advised uh, trying to keep a, a journal, you know, maybe no entries some days, but at least some entries other days. And that kind of helps you um, uh, remember what it is that you did during the week and um, maybe uh, an impetus for doing uh, something the next week that you thought maybe you, you uh, should have done that week. But uh, I think it, it's a, uh, maybe more of a tool uh, just to, uh, uh, keep you current and, and thinking ahead. <clears throat> Any, um, I want to, we've got a few minutes left. Any questions from those of you out there? Thoughts, I comments? A, oh, go a, ahead, Cheryl. I have a comment. Um, talked about board work and working for nonprofits, et cetera. As I'm framing my retirement, I'm, I'm looking at it more as the professional obligation of succession, having leaving our clients in good hands. And thinking of that theme really applies to board work as well. And thinking of the number of really capable people that these recent retirees would still be fresh with, the best contribution I've ever made to any board or committee is recruiting good members. And that's something that I intend to spend more time on in retirement, is helping nonprofits plug the right people in. So just a thought. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. Other comments, thoughts? Was this helpful? Are there areas that we didn't touch on that you wish we would have? Uh, if I can throw one comment out there. When you had asked about podcasts, books, and that kind of stuff, you, fr you framed it in the context of retirement. So I'll reframe it and ask, are there podcasts that you guys in retirement, uh, not necessarily specific to retiring, but just in general that you find to be interesting maybe you hit them every week or whatever um yeah yeah well i listen to the new york times daily podcast every day i do too well i'm not a really big podcast guy i would say that uh, retirement has afforded me more time to read books so i'm constantly on the search for new books that kind of expand my mind um, beyond investments. So that's been a luxury, but uh, 
I frankly kind of get enough video stuff. I'm kind of a throwback. So um, I, I try to avoid a lot of screen time and just happy with books. I actually love podcasts that talk about how people started businesses. So I listen to a lot of um, Guy Rouse's How I Built This. I listen to the Wall Street Journal, various podcasts from there. Wired Magazine does some really good podcast, just little snippets on emerging technologies and things to think about. Because I, my head's always stuck in the future where I really like to think through what are things going to be like on the other side. So there's tons of interesting podcasts. And I'm not retired, but I'm, to Diana's point, I'm walking a lot more lately. And I listen to a lot of those podcasts when I, when I walk. So. What, I, what is the Wired Magazine? Is that what the podcast is called? Yeah, if you if you search Wired, you'll see um, Tech in Two. You'll see, um, I, and I can actually I can t text you. A, I, my biggest problem is I have way too many podcasts que queued up, but the Wired ones I listen to every day, and they're short. That that's what I like about them. They might be two minutes, they might be ten minutes, but they're they're always plugged into some really interesting aspect of what's going on in innovation and technology. So, and we, with that, we are over. Mark, do you want to do any summary comments? I would l love to thank, first off, Ron and Diana for the really insightful comments and for, for sharing so candidly what retirement's been like. So, Mark, any final comments you want to make to wrap it up? Uh, just echoing your thank you to um, uh, Ron and Diana. And uh, I actually fi figured out how to put a an applause um, emoji <laughs> in my window here. So good job, David. Good job. Uh, yes, thank you everybody for joining us. We uh, we did record today's session. Um, so we'll have the uh, the video replay available in the near future. And th um, if th other topics like this, if there's a um, 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 a second layer of a follow-up uh, session that we need to do. Please keep the ideas coming in. We desperately want to make sure that you guys, that we're all connected during these times. So um, any ideas you have on how we can do that and the things that we want to talk about, please send them our way. So uh, with that, um, one last thank you. Carol, thank you for a great job moderating. Sure, really thanks. Thanks so much for letting me, th and thanks again, everyone, for joining. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.